By the time of his death in 2001, Sir Harry Seacombe was one of Britain's best-loved entertainers with a career spanning six decades. No raspberries. Oh, I've got breath for raspberries. I don't know. I'll bring a little currant. <laughs> While he was most recently best known as the reassuring face of Sunday Tea Time TV... That's him! ..he had also played an early part in revolutionising British comedy, along with Spike Milligan and Peter Sellers as one of the goons. What is your name, sir? Harry Sickle. What a splendid memory you've got, sir. <laughs> Harry was larger than life in every sense, but what really made him stand out from the rest was a voice that could move people to tears. Harry would sing an aria and then blow a raspberry and fall over backwards. So there's something there to appeal to everybody. All a far cry from his humble and unassuming roots. The third of four children, Harry Donald Seacombe grew up in a working class family in 1920s Swansea. When he was born, my grandfather said he looked like a threepenny rabbit because he was so little. But uh, he filled out later, obviously. <laughs> if I rule the world, I know what I'd do. I'd get rid of that for a start. <laughs> he was quiet and shy. And in fact, that kind of shyness that he had um, continued right through his life. He was a shy man. Young, skinny Seacombe was a natural comic and used his wit to fend off the school bullies. From the age of seven, he sang in the local church choir, but at first, he was far from a showbiz natural on stage. My sister used to do an act, and uh, she roped me in as a sort of stooge, something I was very reluctant to do. And I was very nervous. But I found out if I took my glasses off like that, I couldn't see anybody, because I can't see without these. So you can imagine, if they're not laughing, they're smiling. And to me, it made a big difference. He wasn't hugely academic, but Harry left school with aspirations of a writing career. At 17, after a short spell as a colliery clerk, he talked his way into the Territorial Army, despite being too young and memorizing the eye chart to pass the medical. When war broke out a few months later, he was called up to the Royal Artillery and made an immediate impression, lampooning the common enemy. Everybody liked Harry. He was the most popular man, I would think, in the regiment. We were stationed at Marlborough for a fortnight's camp. We went up to this pub, and you could mimic. He wasn't very fond of Hitler, but he'd whip out the black comb, pull his hair down a little bit, right hand up in the air, giving the Nazi salute. Of course, at that time, they just stood up and cheered him. <laughs> we were seeing a star being born. Harry saw action in North Africa in 1943. His most momentous encounter of World War II was not with the enemy, but with another bombardier in the Royal Artillery. Tell him the story. We fired the gun and it rolled backwards and went over the cliff. When we looked back, <laughs> it was gone. So, the captain, he said, look, somebody just go down and look for it. I thought, I'll go, sir. Anything to get out of the war. <laughs> so I went down and said, have you seen a gun? <laughs> and uh, this bloke said, what colour? <laughs> the pair's natural comic talent was spotted by Forces Entertainment Scouts and both performed in concert parties laid on to entertain British troops as the war drew to a close. Dad always said he went from being, you know, school idiot to regimental idiot to national idiot, you know, so he honed his sort of idiotic skills, if you like, in the army. Demobbed and back home in Swansea, Harry was to have another chance encounter which would change his life forever. Dad always used to say that if marriage was a lottery, then he bought a winning ticket. Do you remember the dance hall at uh, the Mumbles near Swansea? Of course. Yes. I met my wife. Then. Yes, that's where you met your wife to be. Come in, Mrs. Myra Seacombe, please. Myra! <laughs> I met Harriet at the Mumbles Pier 
in Swansea. It hadn't been a very good night. And uh, I said to my friend, I think I'm going home now. And suddenly this gentleman came and said, can I have this dance, please? And I thought he was Canadian because he had a Czech shirt on. Harry and Myra married two years later in 1948. They would buck the showbiz trend and stay together for more than 50 years, having four children. Harry's family was so important to him, but of course Myra was the rock. No nonsense. She could prick pomposity better than Harry, and he was the best in the world at it. 25-year-old Harry took his first steps on the professional ladder at one of London's most notorious post-war venues. He went to the windmill for an audition and he got the job. They didn't come to see you, the raincoats as they were affectionately known. They came to see the strippers. Well, my brother's a vicar and four of his clerical friends came at odd times to see me. Well, odd times, they came about four times a week. <laughs> Harry had dreamt up the centerpiece of his windmill act back in the army. It would become his signature routine for years to come. The shaving acts consisted of, of him imitating how various people shaved. First of all, let's take a small boy shaving for the first time. <laughs> Someone being observed shaving and being embarrassed about it. Oh. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> shaving. <laughs> I think the first time he did that act, he felt a little unsure of it and so sort of littered, littered it with raspberries. <laughs> He'd give himself the bird before the audience could. So I got there first, folks. The raspberries would become another trademark for Harry, who was now a rising star, both as comic and singer. Inevitably, he found his way onto the BBC radio circuit, where he met fellow ex-serviceman Peter Sellers. The pair hooked up with recently returned bombardier Milligan and Harry's windmill chum, Michael Benteen. By the start of the 50s, they'd formed the blueprint for a surreal revolution in British comedy. Harry thought it was wonderful. They were all of the same wavelength. May I welcome you to The Goon Show and introduce you to The Goon! The interesting thing about The Goons is not a situation that you can really replicate, because I think after the war, they were just amazed to be still alive. They were just grateful that they weren't dead. And had that sense of repressed rage and also liberation. I think it's a specific product of time and place. In 1296, on the Isle of You... Where? Isle of You. I love you too. Shall we dance? <laughs> when the show was first muted to go on the radio, fellas said, what is it, this, this go-on show? The goon show, the go-on show. I mean, how they were. I mean, they used to put evening suits on to appear on the radio. They came along with a total different approach to humour. Well, here it is. The Goon Show! <laughs> Mum took me to a recording of The Goon Show and there were these wild men on stage doing ridiculous things. It was sort of then I realised that, that my father was a, for want of a better term, professional idiot. I was so heavily disguised that not even my own mother would have recognised me. Evening, Nettie. Good evening, Mother. <laughs> Seacombe's job, usually as affable idiot Nettie Seagoon, was to narrate and hold the plot together while absurd sketches, stories and sound effects unfolded. Good work, Bloodluck. You're a born leader of dogs. Yes, I used to be a boxer, you know. <laughs> Defying convention at every turn. Now then, this is my plan of attack. It looks like a nail. No, it's a tack. <laughs> Out of all the goons, Harry was the one that provoked the most affection. Uh, certainly Spike was a bit of a mystery person, and Peter Sellers was... strange. I say, do you know that I got an electric twit for Christmas? <laughs> Harry was the one that we could all relate to. <laughs> He was the pivot of the show. All the mad ones revolved round him. 
And Spike always said, Harry's pretending to be mad. Peter and I are the real thing. What's that ahead? It's a head. Yes, but whose is it? It is mine, my Jackie. <laughs> Harry once said to me that the goon show was brandy fueled. The histories of Pliny the Elder, that's my favourite. That's one of the ones where you can hear they're really slaughtered. <laughs> Keys and make our way down to the Tiber. Watch the Tiber. Abbas Dida. You can just hear sort of the giggles are getting more and more manic. Come on, look at your white paper now. And it's my father's laughter, as he was as a person. <laughs> the goons recorded several successful singles, though this did present an unexpected clash with Harry's burgeoning parallel career as a straight singer. I remember when Ying Tong came out, and that was great, you know, the fact that Dad was on this mad record that loads of my friends like. <laughs> But, of course, Dad wasn't allowed to sing. Because of his exclusive contract with Phillips, he wasn't allowed to sing on any of the records or on any of the shows. Phillips owned his voice. And so if you listen to Ying Tong Song, he speaks, sings. He doesn't actually break into song. <laughs> Harry Seekin, the first rapper. My son would be proud. <laughs> The goons may have been rebels tearing up the comedy rulebook, but they were becoming unlikely darlings of the establishment, with some very special fans. I get my own back on him if it's the last thing I do. Yes! Oh, sailor! Harry Seacombe and the other goons had taken the country by storm. What's this then? My name is Bannister. I've seen you on the stairs. <laughs> but it seems they aroused especially extreme devotion in another clown prince of the time. A horror film. Just because you got bigger legs than I have, Absolute you think rough. you can tell me what to do? Yeah. If you're feeling pimply and your knees are Prince Charles's love for the show led to a lifelong friendship with Seacom, and inspired this bizarre piece of home cinema. Uh, I'll get my own back on him if it's the last thing I do. Yes, I will. Charles was a huge Goon Show fan, loved it. And for him, probably the Goon Show was like an outlet. I mean, if you're in that sort of business, as you were, something like the Goon Show is the perfect antidote, isn't it, to all the sort of starchiness. <laughs> Dad had known Prince Charles since he was young, so it was like a constant in Charles's youth and growing up. They had a wonderful, humorous exchange that seemed to go on forever. They used to send funny little notes and things, and they made each other laugh. We'd get the Christmas card, so that was always very exciting, from the palace. When Harry was in hospital once, Prince Charles sent him some bottles with all funny things like, please do not take poison and all that, all funny gags all written over it. And uh, he was thrilled with that. But it wasn't only Charles who took a shine to Harry. He was a hit with the rest of the royal family too. The Queen even made a special appearance at one of Harry's shows at Television Centre in 1973. Did you remember to lock the car? Did you remember to change the guard? <laughs> <laughs> People thought that we're safe with him. He's not going to pee in the trifle or... or, or, or <laughs> or do something off-colour. Harry had certainly become a man in demand. Throughout the 50s, during his time with the Goons, he toured all over Britain's variety theatre circuit and enjoyed huge success in the West End, where he topped the bill at the most famous theatre of all. In the 50s, if you were a turn in variety, the big, you know, mecca was to play the Palladium. It was top of the list of every performer's dream, really. And of course, Dad was top of the bill there, I think about five times. Despite his experience and popularity, Harry's childhood stage jitters never left him. He was always nervous, Harry. We'd be in the wings with his, his towel, his glass of water, and he said, it couldn't be all right, isn't it, my? I said, yeah, of course, don't worry, it'd be all right. And then as soon as he crossed that line, he was, hello, folks. He came on stage like a... like a train. <laughs> oh, I, 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 
I should like to start off the proceedings tonight by singing a few a lovely old Peruvian folk song accompanied by the mass tambourines of the Salvation Army in the French. Thank you, Sir George. It was wonderful. He, he loved the buzz of a, of a live audience. I'm a, I'm a Monty. I, I always get my man. <laughs> <laughs> it was like home from home for my brother Andy and I used to go up on a Saturday and we'd sit probably in the Royal Box and watch one of the shows and then we'd go backstage. We were very good and knew what we should and shouldn't do. Harry was also getting a reputation for nurturing up-and-coming talent. From Scarsland is Jimmy Tarbuck! <laughs> It was the best year of my show business life, and I've been lucky and fortunate, but that was the happiest year I've ever had working with him. It was like being with your favorite uncle. Oh, you've got all the gear on tonight, haven't you? Looking very sharp. Where'd you get that, rent a tent? <laughs> he was a rascal, Harry, for making you laugh. Work, I got into trouble lots of times, because I roared laughing with him. Now what do we do? <laughs> Change him. Change him? For a quieter model. <laughs> now. But what gave Harry the edge over other variety performers of the time was a distinctive bell canto tenor singing voice. You know, comics through the years always finish with a song, uh, even if they couldn't sing. But seek him, boy, could he sing at the end of his act. I remember my dad's singing voice because my dad would scream in my ear atop C to wake me up in the morning. I remember that several occasions. But his voice was beautiful. I mean, it really was gorgeous. He had a fantastic operatic voice. Brilliant. I liked Nessun Dorma. I sang that in Davy when I think everybody was in short pants. I know it's now played to death, but at the time was not very well known, uh, and it, I can't really listen to it because it brings tears to my eyes. Harry's voice was classically trained by a renowned Italian maestro every Sunday morning before he recorded The Goon Show. That tenor voice enriched itself when he had that training. What it did was warm up the strength and the power of the voice. So if he did any of those lovely tenor moments, he was there, he could do it, and he knew he could do it. On the advice of his teacher, Seacombe considered a straight singing career, but ultimately he decided against it. The musical world is very serious, and Dad just wasn't very serious. He also uh, didn't play an instrument, um, and he didn't really read music. Um, so I think there was also a sense that he would be entering a world he didn't know. Um, terribly well and would have been out of his depth. But he did find the perfect compromise, combining his huge comedy success with a remarkable singing career. He would go on to release more than 70 albums and enjoy regular hit singles. He could turn his voice to anything. And that's quite unique, I think, because there are so many opera singers or classical singers that try to sing the, um, the popular stuff, and it just sounds naff, but Harry could do it all. But where Harry's singing success was based on wholesome, old-fashioned stylings, his newfound TV career in the mid-50s was every bit as radical as the goons had been on radio. This footage of his first TV series was recently discovered at the family home. There'd been some money spent on that show, and it was really lavish by the standards of variety shows of the time. It climaxed with an extraordinary sequence, all performed live on the BBC. Harry's singing an aria to enormous applause from the audience, and suddenly musketeers break in and he's fencing with them. And then full chorus in lovely dresses, top hats and tails come on. 
and then the next minute they're attacking cameras and the cameramen are fighting back. And they're fighting in the street. Car draws up, drivers fighting the musketeers off. And you think, well, that's it. Then you cut to Peter Haig, man who did a lot of continuity announcing, was well known on television. The next minute, the fences erupt around him. Oh, it was just glorious. And uh, there again, that was a groundbreaker, and Seacombe was involved. And uh, now here's a summary of the weather report. Harry was a sort of roly-poly person, um, but he was also an anarchist. Often people who are anarchic are rather dangerous and perhaps a bit alarming, but Harry was never alarming. He was just adorable. <laughs> Well, how'd you like the show so far? <laughs> As primetime TV really hit its stride in the 60s and 70s, Harry was quite literally all over it. Yeah, this is all this week. Everybody's been going around going... Mm. <laughs> Still haven't got it. <laughs> Harry was very much a part of the landscape. He was a tremendously well-known brand. In those days, Saturday night, primetime, it was... Harry Seacombshire. Poor fellow, how on earth did it happen? <laughs> I caught it at the door. <laughs> My best friend's up there, you know. What? Since yesterday. Oh, well, I'm very sorry. I, I didn't know. That's all right. He's on the roof doing the tiling. <laughs> if Harry Seacombe asked you to be on his show, that was it. People said, of course. Who wants to be a millionaire? I don't. Who wants to journey on the gigantic yacht? Do you want a yacht, Eckle? <laughs> Who wants a fancy foreign car? Never mind about fancy foreign cars, mate! A lot of people boast about having done it afterwards and beam when they said they'd been asked to do it. Who wants to live on caviar? At these prices, who can afford it? <laughs> His popularity with fellow performers and viewers was in no small part down to Harry's slavish professionalism. Whatever he'd done, if he'd been a window cleaner, he'd have been the best window cleaner. You know, nobody else would have done your windows like he did your windows. He just constantly pushed himself. <laughs> We were worried whether Harry would do it or not. I would do steps, and I'd do them, and I'd say, Harry, how's that? And he said, do it again, show me that. All right, I can do that. By George, he's got it! You think that's an easy thing to do, that it ain't. And it's also not easy to purposely miss it. And Harry did it beautifully. That's timing, and that's what Harry had. One of my favourite pieces is when he mimes to a, a scratched record, and what you get here is um, the total Sir Harry Seacombe package. If you want to see a human cartoon done immaculately, it's a masterclass. And Harry Seacombe miming to that record at speeding up, slowing down, stopping, starting. Oh, that is just an object lesson how to do it. But you've got to be as good as him to do it. You know, this is somebody at the top of their game, but he must have spent hours and hours and hours listening to that piece of music to get it just right. And that's what he was about, you know. He wasn't somebody who'd just turn up and wing it. He, he knew what he was doing. He was confident in his own ability. He was the ultimate all-round entertainer, but Harry's relentless work and social schedule would eventually take its toll. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harry Seacombe. 
By the mid-1960s, Harry Seacombe's lovable comic charm and stunning voice had made him one of Britain's best-loved entertainers, and his fame didn't end with the small screen. Across his career, he appeared in over a dozen movies, some better received than others. But the most famous of the lot was 1968 musical Oliver, where he played orphanage overseer Mr. Bumble. I want some more. More? The best picture of the year, Oliver. I think he felt more at home doing Oliver than um, he did with many of his other films. Because he was so right for that part, he was so right for Mr. Bumble. Mr. Bumble, ain't you a trembling when I speak, Oliver? Sometimes when he told me off, he looked like Mr. Bumble, so it was kind of like, it was kind of an extension of Dad to a certain extent. The hardest, from my point of view, was actually showing fear, because I knew him as Harry Seacombe, and Harry was this warm, lovable, cuddly sort of character. He was always joking, always having a laugh, and when the camera stopped, he'd always fire off these quick one-liners. So he's very, very good at making everyone feel very relaxed around him. And trying to pretend to be afraid of this chat was actually quite difficult. What? Carol Reed won an Oscar for Best Director, but he still had a few playground tricks up his sleeve for Harry. Carol Reed decided to make a plastic ear for me which was fit on the top of my ear. And then the scene when Mr. Bumble has to grab Oliver by the ear, the ear obviously would come away. Oliver, Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more. So we did the take, and Harry Seacombe grabs my ear, comes off in his hand. It's this amazing moment where his eyes are in shock, then bewilderment, and then he just cracked up. I think Dad was absolutely mortified because obviously, you know, <laughs> there's this young child and Dad was quite strong. I remember him saying he felt absolutely dreadful, so bless him, it must have been awful. He will rule the day, somebody name him Oliver. It was another Dickens character that gave Harry his most successful stage role in a show that ran for almost two years in London's West End. He was very proud of it. They went to Broadway with it. Dad was up for a Tony Award. So it was quite a massive chunk of his career was, was tied up with Pickwick. And of course, If I Ruled the World is one of his most famous songs. I went to the first night of Pickwick and he was wonderful as Pickwick. And suddenly, he sang this song. If I rule the world, every day would be the first day of spring. The song went on to become Harry's unofficial anthem wherever he appeared on stage. And we'd sing of the joy every morning would bring. After a performance of Pickwick, as with any show he'd done, Harry's dressing room was the place to be. To get to our dressing rooms, which were upstairs, uh, you had to pass Harry's door, always open. I mean, the dressing room, you'd walk in there and there'd be uh, Dolavera and all, all the England cricket team and we'll go and see Harry. And there was the open bar. And a, and a few bottles of brandy would get knocked back like that. Oh, yes, it was open house. But the theatre wasn't always plain sailing. When Harry took his first straight role in The Plumber's Progress, there were problems right from the off. We opened at the Prince of Wales Theatre and we immediately knew we were in trouble because Harry's audience didn't want to see him serious. There were a lot of tough old ladies and they'd shout out at him. And there was a scene where he elopes with the girl. It's a rather, you know, romantic uh, scene in the moonlight. And one of the old ladies shouted out one afternoon, Put one on her, Harry, go on! <laughs> Despite a gruelling schedule across stage and screen, Seacombe also somehow found time to write two novels. The first, Twice Brightly, was a bestseller. Harry was someone who was extremely intelligent and perhaps 
because of the comedy. Some people might not have realized that, but he was, and he wrote beautifully, he read copiously. When he first had Twice Brightly, his novel in his hands, it was something tangible, you know, with a, with a stage appearance or a television appearance, it's gone like that. But with a book, you know, it stays on the shelf, doesn't it? He may have been multi-talented and hugely famous, but Seacombe never lost his common touch. Everybody loved Harry. They would greet him in the street. The cab drivers would be going, oh, Hi, Harry. Walking in his wake was, was very special. We had to share him with the rest of the world when he was out working, but the rest of the time he was ours. He was a great father, and because he was quite childish, he enjoyed mucking about. He was as much a child as we all were, really. I think it was my mum that was the parent. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we all got a really good dose, you know, of, of, uh, of family life, even if he was working really hard. And we did have some fantastic holidays. Lovely holidays. 20 Christmases we went to Barbados and all of them took the kids. Dad was a very private family man, but he really enjoyed a laugh with his mates, you know, and that was as important, I think. And he found a way of putting his love for a party to very good use. For many years he held a charity cricket match. But at Sudbury Hill, Norman Wisdom and Harry Seacombe have their own ideas about how cricket should be played. So has Tommy Cooper. The match is between the Jesters and the Thespians. The charity matches became a regular fixture each summer, attracting a string of celebrity folk to Cheam, where the family lived for 30 years. I remember going out to the back garden and there was Tom Baker standing in the garden going, hello. <laughs> There were lots of people milling about. I remember John Mills, all the goons, all sorts of people, probably quite drunk, you know. We had a fantastic bar in Cheam, which was white leatherette padded with really <laughs> amazing <laughs> features of <laughs> glass. It was really, like, bling-tastic, and um, it was very well stocked, and people just enjoyed themselves from morning till night. I remember parties sort of going on and on and on. You're about eight and you've got school the next day. And they're still going downstairs. Harry's work with his favourite charity, the Army Benevolent Fund, had earned him a CBE in 1963. And 18 years later, there was more good news. I got a letter through the post saying the Prime Minister has it in mind to present you with a knighthood. And I thought it was from Milligan. I looked at very suspiciously the envelope and said, please say yes or no. So I, I agreed in about 20 seconds. We had a cocker spaniel and uh, my mum was bathing the dog. The letter came through and Dad told Mum and she went, oh, I can't be a lady or something like that. <laughs> it's a bit of a strange experience for Mum and Dad. He was delighted. We had a lot of jokes about it, of course, you know. But he went to play golf one day and uh, he spread his trousers. Never mind, Harry. The trousers have gone. Huh? Oh. How many of those about, you know? <laughs> well, <I'll... laughs> It's all the power in the legs. I'll have to have a word with your tailor. So will I. And he came home and he was desperate. What if I do it before the Queen, you know? So he hired his, his, his tailor to reinforce all his trousers. And uh, that was funny. So I said, let's, OK, he said it was Sunday. It was Sunday lunchtime. I said, uh, but come on, bend down. And I had the carving knife and I said, arise, Sir Harry Seacom. There we are, I'm spread your trousers. <laughs> Up top of the world. You're the drink now. Just leave me to the pub. <laughs> this way. <Sir> Harry Arms. <laughs> <laughs> Harry survived the trouser crisis, but at almost 20 stone, he was heavier than ever before. In typical Seacombe style, he christened himself 
circumference. My dad's downfalls were pasta. You know, he loved spaghetti and my mother's gravy, I think. I remember people were expressing reservations about his weight, thinking he really must do something about this. Harry had come through a major scare after having emergency surgery for peritonitis, but against the advice of the doctors, he'd continued to enjoy the good life. Eventually, it caught up with him. I was at boarding school, and Mum was out in Australia with Dad, and I had a phone call from my mum. I think I was in a biology lesson saying, your dad's not been very well. Dad was told very bluntly by um, an Australian doctor uh, that uh, if he didn't lose weight, he was going to die in uh, the two years. Uh, it sort of focused his mind on things. Um, and I think it was the first time he had intimations of uh, mortality, really, because I think he thought he was indestructible. Harry Seacombe survived a potentially fatal stomach condition, peritonitis, in 1980. The following year, aged 60, he was told he had just two years to live if he didn't lose weight. He came very close to dying. And then his lifestyle had to change. I mean, did he enjoy a drink? Yes, he did. So he had to stop that. He was told that he was diabetic, and he was told he had to lose weight, and the best way to do that was to completely, completely change his diet. So Harry set about shedding some of the excess poundage, and in just a matter of months, he'd lost a whopping five stone. So I went to diet then, and I haven't had a drink since that day. Do you miss it? I'm thirsty. <laughs> The new slimline Seacombe was back, paying a flying visit to see the troops after the Falklands conflict. I've lost weight, have you noticed? I have. I've seen things I haven't seen before for years. It also inspired this, one of the first celebrity diet books to be published in the UK. Harry's brush with death prompted him to try his hand at something new. But when he was offered the presenter role on ITV's new religious show, Highway, in 1983, he had initial reservations. I wasn't sure at first whether, you know, to do it because with the raspberry blowing and the goon show and everything else, I was hardly the man to be a religious presenter. If I rule the world, every day would be the first day of... But of course, Harry did say yes and was soon the face of Sunday tea time meeting people with a story to tell and belting out his favourite songs. It was a little bit difficult as a teenager, an awkward teenager, which I was, you know, um, seeing my father front a religious programme like Highway. But, you know, it was a great format and it was a great programme, so now it's fine. <laughs> When Highway went on the road to Rome, a young apprentice got a taste of Harry's usual spirited hijinks. My parents had left me uh, in the hotel bar at the age of 13 and a half or something. Um, they'd gone to bed and Harry said, don't worry, I'll look after him, I'll bring him to the room later. And Harry said, have you ever had wine? I was like, no, I don't like wine, I'll have Diet Coke. He went, no, it's about time you tried wine, you'll love it. Get him a glass. And so I'm having a glass of red wine with Harry singing Welsh hymns on a piano in a hotel bar in Rome. It doesn't get much better than that. Despite regular audiences of seven million, Highway was canned in the early 90s, prompting a record number of viewer complaints. Harry was soon back on our screens, fronting rival BBC show Songs of Praise, but it would be his last major presenting role. Harry had gone out to France to present uh, Songs of Praise for Remembrance Sunday, and um, the phone went, and I picked it up, and it was Harry phoning from France. Hi, Medwin, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, Harry. How are you? Oh, not too good. Oh, what's, what's the problem, Harry? I've got cancer. The doctor's told me I've got cancer. Dad put 
a quite a positive spin on getting his cancer. He never made a big deal of it. When it was diagnosed, he was like, oh, well, you know, we all, the, the, you know, a lot of men get prostate cancer. It's, you know, part and parcel of getting old. But at the age of 77, just days before starting radiotherapy, Harry suffered a devastating stroke at home. That was a huge blow. That was, that was, that was bigger than the cancer, really. Because he'd been so vital and so warm and vigorous. And then suddenly he was, you know, he was, he was sort of turned into a, an old man overnight, almost. Harry agreed to let cameras follow his battle with the effects of the stroke in the hope it would inspire others in a similar position. When I got to the hospital and saw Harry, he was paralysed on one side. And it was quite sad, really, that this superstar had been hit in such a way. Although Harry was still able to speak, he had lost his once great operatic singing voice. Music had always been such a part of his life, singing. And he expressed so much through that. And... That was just cut off. I'll do a national normal yet. <laughs> Not today. He braved it out, bless him, you know, and he and he he's a, he was a fighter and he really he fought back and he was determined he was gonna get up and start walking around again. When they sort of realised what they could do with the physiotherapy, I mean he really battled to actually sort of get as much of his old life back as as he could, and the fact that he achieved to actually, to the extent that he did, I think was nothing short of heroic. Pain at all. Tell me, how do I look now? Well, Harry, uh, I'll tell you, for the last five years, I've been laying flowers in a grave that I thought was yours. <laughs> so I think, as a, 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 a result of that, <laughs> you're remarkably well. Yes, you're looking remarkably well. Despite his best efforts, Harry spent much of his final two years in and out of hospital after suffering further strokes. The prostate cancer, which had been in remission for much of his rehabilitation, also returned. Jennifer, I went to see him, and he did a joke in the bed. He tried to put the, the, the sheet over his head, you know, and we, and we were hysterical. So he's, he was trying right up to the end to be funny, you know. Harry died on April the 11th, 2001, age 79. And the nurses cried when he died. <laughs> yes, they cried. Yeah, it was very sad. It's like this big tree in the forest falling over. Um, you know, something you've, you've sheltered under and depended on for years and years and years, and suddenly sort of gone, suddenly uh, you know, open to the sky. It's hard to describe the loss that we feel. Um, because he was, he was just lovely, he was dad. Oh. This was a mock obituary. It was written by Sir Harry Seacombe in January 2001. Born 1921, soldier 38 to 46. Met Spike Milligan 1944 when his howitzer fell over a cliff. Married 48, 5160. The Goal Show! Four kids, The Palladium, Pickwick, Oliver, records, books, telly, <laughs> peritonitis, diabetes, knighthood, prostate cancer, stroke, malaria expected soon, wind, Slight to variable, the wonderful Sahari Seeker. Yakamakaka. <laughs>